1947, three shots from a carbine rifle killed Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. The gangster who turned sleepy Las Vegas into a gambling mecca. Everyone knew the mob killed him. The same night in Las Vegas, Siegel's former partner, Mo Sedway, strode into Bugsy's casino. Moe's wife, Beatrice, stood by his side. Moe walked up to, to the microphone within five minutes after it happened and said, taking over the Flamingo, Benjamin Siegel is dead. Siegel's murder made a perverse star of the woman who was Bugsy's baby, Virginia Hill. She added a border of black lace and an air of seduction to the violent picture of organized crime. Like the men around her, she too would draw the attention of American justice. Even Congress would eventually demand to know where she got her power and her money. Like a lot of girls, that they've uh, given me things and bought me everything I want. Then when I was with Ben, he paid for everything. By Ben, you mean Ben Siegel? Yes. And... Uh, he gave me some money, too, and bought me a house in Florida. Virginia's rise was typical of women who get involved with the mob. A small-town tramp from Georgia, she fled to the bright lights of Chicago's 1933 World's Fair. Working sometimes as a dancer, sometimes as a hooker, the voluptuous teenager soon fell in with the mafia. Then Virginia met an accountant for crime boss Al Capone named Joe Epstein. He taught her manners and style. She took Joe's advice, but she did not respond to his advances. I know that Joe Epstein loved Virginia Hill. He told me that, that he loved Virginia Hill. And he had a very, very uh, obsession with Virginia Hill as her mentor. Uh, and, and he felt that if it wasn't for him, uh, Virginia Hill would be, never have been amounted to anything. She would have been a, a, a lowly prostitute from the South. The gangster's lavish lifestyle and brutal power seemed glamorous to a poor Southern girl. Like Virginia, young Beatrice Sedway also left a small town to become a nightclub dancer and a mob lady. Whoever was a sweetheart or a mistress or anything was just kept in the best ways. They had everything they wanted. If they'd have been millionaires, they couldn't have been better treated. Being kept wasn't enough for Virginia Hill. She wanted some of the power from the men who ran the mob. She had all the traits of a mob lady. She was attractive, she was smart, and she knew how to keep her mouth shut. The Chicago mob soon had Virginia doing its work, carrying stolen goods, laundering money at racetracks, working for its Mexican drug racket. By the mid-1930s, the FBI had opened a file on Virginia, a suspected racketeer. She was fast becoming the most powerful woman in American organized crime. In New York City, she crossed paths with the movie star handsome and monstrously brutal Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. They called him baby blue eyes, they called him bedroom eyes. Uh, every woman that met him just went crazy about him. But they were all, like, afraid of him. It was in Los Angeles that Bugsy and Virginia's affair became a legend. L.A. was a mob boomtown. The Chicago mob was closing in on the motion picture unions. New York sent Bugsy Siegel out west to tie up the gambling operations. Virginia was also in L.A. for the Chicago outfit, living in the Beverly Hills Hotel, or renting homes such as this. She worked the Hollywood party circuit, recruiting gamblers. It was at one of those parties that Virginia and Bugsy looked at each other and found what they wanted. Lust, I would call it. Lust and obsession, obsession with one another. Once L.A. was in his pocket, Bugsy set his sights on Las Vegas. He envisioned big-time gambling and entertainment where others saw only desert scrub. Siegel took Virginia, fellow mobster Mo Sedway, and Mo's wife, Beatrice, along for field trips. And there was only one road going out to Las Vegas, and if, it were two tire tracks through the sand and the dirt, leaving L.A. And we went in, into Vegas, and I thought, gee, what do they want with a place like that? Using mob funds from New York, Siegel took charge of building a monument to greed, the Flamingo, 
a casino named for the beautiful long legs of Bugsy's baby, Virginia Hill. But nothing went smoothly. Construction costs doubled as Siegel was accused of skimming from the mob to pay his gambling debts. Even as the casino finally opened, his relationship with Virginia was turning more violent, with fights carried out in public and settled in private. Wherever they stayed in, in, in his room, he had a, he had a suite there. Uh, everything was broken. <laughs> Lamps, ashtrays, it didn't make anything different. And the help would stand out in the corridor, me too sometimes, and listen to him. And then after they'd have this big fight, then they'd make love like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Siegel had made too many enemies in his violent career, and they sent a warning to Virginia, get away from Siegel. Virginia announced she was going to Paris and left Siegel on his own. On the night of June 20th, 1947, Siegel sat reading the paper on the couch in Virginia's rented house. That's where he was hit. I often wonder where she was when she first heard the news. Was she in a nightclub? Was she in her bedroom in a hotel? Or did she hear it over the radio? Or how did she hear it, you know? After the murder, Virginia attempted suicide four times with a combination of sleeping pills and booze. She kept working for the Chicago outfit, but kept a low profile. In 1950, in Sun Valley, Virginia pursued and married an Austrian ski instructor named Hans Hauser. But if she had dreams of finally settling down, American justice had other plans for Virginia. In 1951, Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee launched a crusade against organized crime. Virginia was a star witness. Grilled by the Kefauver committee about her association with mobsters like Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky. Did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. And uh, did you ever uh, get any money from Meyer Lansky? I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those None fellas. of those fellas. None of the... None, none of these that I've been them. reading about, or none that I knew, they never gave me anything. None of the Fichettes? No. I don't even speak to the... I, I mean, I met that Charlie once or twice. I don't even talk to him. You don't like him? No. Virginia left the hearing convinced that she had bamboozled the senators, and the committee hadn't laid a finger on her. She was wrong. American justice wanted to catch up with Virginia Hill, just as it had with big mobsters like Al Capone. Through the IRS... Like many organized crime figures, Hill did not report her illicit income. By this time, Hill was trying to live a quiet life in Spokane, Washington, with her husband and two-year-old son. The family was under constant FBI surveillance. Then immigration officials pressured her Austrian husband to leave the country, along with their child. And as Virginia was trying to board a plane to meet them, she was told there was a lien on her house. It would be auctioned off to pay back taxes the government said she owed, $161,000. Fearing prosecution, she fled the United States and joined her family in Switzerland. The feds charged her with tax evasion and threatened to arrest her if she tried to re-enter the U.S. The Treasury Department even issued a wanted poster. Stuck in Switzerland, Hill was no longer of any use to the mob. When she turned to them for help, they ignored her. She began drinking heavily. Her marriage fell apart. Then, one day, she disappeared. On March 24, 1966, her body was found near a quiet brook in Austria. The coroner said it was suicide, most likely from a drug overdose. Others contend the mafia poisoned Hill, fearing she would reveal their secrets. In either case, the best-known mob lady ever died a sorry death on a deserted mountainside. Since the mob has always been run by and for men, the power of a mob lady is defined by the men around her. By that definition, Virginia Hill succeeded more than most. And yet, after the giddy, flamboyant life she led with the mob, she was abandoned, left powerless and vulnerable. But that glamorous facade can be alluring. In the 1940s, a Jewish girl on the Lower East Side of Manhattan grew up wanting nothing more than to be just like Virginia Hill. The mink coats, the casinos, the powerful men with their secret world of violence and intrigue. Arlene Weiss Brickman got her wish 
But in becoming a mob lady, she lost everything. As the leading mob lady witness before the Kefauver Commission in 1951, Virginia Hill was living proof that a certain kind of woman could wield influence within the Mafia. Her performance made a powerful impression on a New York City teenager named Arlene Weiss. My role model was Virginia Hill. The first day that I ever saw Virginia Hill on television, I imagined myself to be Virginia Hill. And what I did was copy myself after her. Arlene would become a mob lady herself and then use the power of American justice to turn against the mob. Even as a child growing up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Arlene was no stranger to the world of gangsters. Her maternal grandmother, Ida Bloom, ran a funeral parlor and was a mob lady in her own right. Her place of business was a hangout for Jewish mobsters, many of whom were establishing ties to the traditional Sicilian mafia. She had an undertaking parlor upstairs, and she had the bookmaking concession downstairs, and what they would do is pay her by the week for letting them have the business, they would put the money in the caskets downstairs. And she would take money out of the caskets, like a little pin money. Naturally, Grandmother Ida was a big fan of the Mafia. She loved them because they were dangerous. And not only were they dangerous, but she made a lot of money with them. So uh, she loved them even better. Arlene's father, a Rolls-Royce salesman named Irving Weiss, did favors for the mob whenever he could, and even owned a Miami Beach bar with a high-ranking member of the Italian Mafia named Joe Adonis, a man renowned, among other things, for his own affair with Virginia Hill. Irving Weiss would bet on horses with his mob friends, and while he told his daughter he didn't want her getting mixed up with them, he did nothing to prevent it. I always found myself at the racetrack with my father. I always found myself at the fights with my father. In other words, I was always with my father with all these different men, even though he never wanted me to be around them. But the men wanted to be around Arlene. They began giving her gifts and money in return for sexual favors. At the age of 14, she met and became involved with a soldier in New York's Bonanno crime family named Tony Mira. For Tony, I would do anything. I didn't even give a shit if I got money, I didn't get money. But over time, Arlene discovered that the New York wise guys made lousy lovers. I have been around a lot of mob guys. And they are the worst lovers in the world. They don't care if you, if they satisfy you, you have an orgasm or whatever. They're mainly concerned, let's do it, get it over with. And while you're in bed, they're telling you about, uh, let's see now, what are we going to play with a football team for Saturday or Sunday? What number am I going to play for the day? Who am I going to kill? Uh, how am I going to kill them? At 17, Arlene got involved with a friend of her father's, a middle-aged mobster named Nate Nelson. The mob was unhappy with Nady because he talked too much. One day in the fall of 1951, Arlene stopped by Nady's apartment to get some shopping money. When I got there, um, I saw another friend of my father's coming out of his apartment who was involved with the Italian mob, the Genovese family. And his name was Jimmy Doyle. And there he was coming out of the apartment and put his hat up to his head, carrying his coat. I'll never forget that day. And there inside, I discovered Nady on the floor. It was a horror to see. He was dead. And I figured, well, I was scared shit, pardon my language. And I figured I wasn't going to be the one to report this and get involved in it. But Jimmy Doyle used the situation to intimidate Arlene and force her to have sex with him. What I was doing is keeping myself alive, hoping and praying that he wasn't going to kill me for keeping his secret. A shocking turn of events for a young mob lady who had thus far succeeded in using sex to manipulate her wise guy boyfriends. Arlene was scared enough to make her first, but not final, exit from the mob. In 1956, at the age of 23, she was in a doctor's office getting her ninth abortion. And there, while I was having an abortion, that is sitting in the 
office, I met up with the only husband that I ever married, Miss Norman Brickman. The couple had a baby girl, Leslie. But Arlene soon discovered that her husband, who worked in the New York Garment District, running a fur cleaning business, was not only stealing furs he was supposed to be cleaning, he was also cheating on her. She took revenge by turning him into the cops. I think that was my first time involved with law enforcement because Norman wasn't going to get away with this. I made sure Norman spent a lot of years in jail. Armed with the lesson that if she ever again needed to take revenge, she could use American justice to exact it, Arlene returned to her first love, the mob, and did so with a vengeance. Because I used to do all these crazy things, going out with all these different wise guys, running around, I mean, uh, you see women running around with mink coats and nothing on underneath? I did that. With her parents taking care of her baby daughter, Arlene, the reincarnated mob lady, hit the New York mob party circuit. I used to wear dresses that way I couldn't even go to the bathroom in. I couldn't even pick them up. And I gave the best <laughs> around and I knew it. So, I mean, nobody could resist me. Arlene didn't want to marry any of the gangsters. One brush with that institution had been enough. What she wanted was to be a mafia mistress. A mob wife never goes anywhere. You gotta really feel sorry for her. A mob mistress, mob mistresses. A woman that goes out with a married man, uh, knows everything about his business, must keep her mouth shut, and for keeping her mouth shut, she's well paid. Arlene made it a point to sleep with members of every one of New York's five major crime families, including mob boss Joe Colombo. It was a calculated move that I could get involved with every one of them and that they would always do me a favor. I was very good to them and they would always do me a favor, I thought, if I ever got into trouble. Trouble came one summer night in 1964 in the basement of a dirty Times Square bar. Arlene was used to come-ons from hoodlums of all sorts. But this time, when she turned down a proposition from one mobster acquaintance, he and three others gang-raped her. Seeking revenge, Arlene went first to the wise guys. Oh, I said to myself, he's going to be punished. They're going to they're gonna beat him up. They're going to kill him. They're going to this. I mean, after all, I was a mob girl. I had done favors for all these men. Nothing was done. Nothing. They stuck together. And so from that day on, I said to myself, screw you. I could use another word. I'm going to get back at you, every one of you. And so I set out to get back to, at them. And when the opportunity came, I got back at them in spades. As a mob lady, Arlene Weiss Brickman was trading on one commodity, sex. Hardly an original strategy, but it got her in with the wise guys and into the life she wanted to lead. After the brutal rape, however, Arlene wanted revenge. And she used American justice to get it. She turned to a new commodity, information. The kind of information that only a mob lady can provide. Revenge, a time-honored mafia principle. Years after she was raped in Times Square and her wise guy connections had done nothing about it, mob lady Arlene Weiss Brickman would turn to American justice, become an informant to get her revenge. He was a chance to get back at them without them even knowing. So why shouldn't I do it? By 1969, Arlene was in her late 30s, living in a Fort Lee, New Jersey apartment just outside New York City, but still with the wise guys. She was having an affair with a small-time racketeer named Tommy Zito. Zito and his buddies in the Genovese crime family ran a numbers racket, an illegal betting operation based on horse racing results. Arlene began running the racket with Tommy and storing up information information she planned to use one day when the time was right. The more I had on them, the more I could get further in the mob. I could blackmail them and get away with it. But Arlene and Tommy made mistakes. They dumped betting slips in the trash. Neighbors found them and turned them over to police. 
they were busted. And so we became very lax. And in the number business or any business with the mob, you can't become lax. When it came time to pay Arlene's bail, her mother came through with the $15,000. Tommy got a year in prison while Arlene got off with probation. She went home and went right back into the numbers racket. But Tommy still owed money to loan sharks, money he had borrowed to cover his own gambling debts. Arlene couldn't afford the weekly interest payments, so she stopped paying. Some of the money Tommy had borrowed came from a rising star in the Gambino family named John Gotti. Nobody got away with welching on Gotti. When Tommy got out of prison on work release, a pair of Gotti's goons caught up with him on a street in Fort Lee and beat him up. Then the mob started making threats against Arlene's teenage daughter. When I stopped paying, they came to the house and they were going to hurt Leslie. They were going to rape her, they were going to kill her, they were going to everything because she was the love of my life. For Arlene, the time had come to cash in her mob lady chips. She contacted the police detective who had arrested her and said she had some information for him. Arlene had the goods on so many mobsters, the FBI was also interested. The Bureau needed an insider who could help them break up the loan shark racket. They wanted Arlene to wear a wire. No problem. I didn't give a shit if I wore a wire. I didn't care what I did as long as I got these people off my back and they weren't going to hurt Leslie. Arlene jumped right into her new racket, informing on mobsters she'd known for years. And when she told the FBI she didn't want to be harassed by Brooklyn loan sharks anymore, they gave her money to pay off Tommy Zito's loans. And then I had learned about the most important thing, that from the government you can get money. I mean, I was getting money from the mob, guys. I was getting money from the, uh, from the government. When the feds went after the loan sharks Arlene was secretly taping, the mob lady left New Jersey for her own safety. She joined up with her old wise guy boyfriend, Tommy Zito, in Atlantic Beach, Long Island. Zito was now trafficking cocaine and heroin. Arlene helped him out, taking cash payments from street dealers. But she was playing both sides of the street and ratting on drug dealers to the feds. And I became involved with the DEA, and I did put away some drug dealers, but not little drug dealers, big drug dealers. Including this man, Billy Ricky Udi, a mob-connected marijuana dealer who Arlene first did business with and then turned into the DEA. Arlene's work as an informant was kept secret, so the mob had no idea what she was doing. But the drug business took its toll when Arlene's daughter, Leslie, turned into a heroin addict. I found myself running on the Lower East Side looking for Leslie at different heroin places where, you know, they would hide out and they would shoot it up and I would scream and I would carry on. To make matters worse, Tommy had not learned his lesson and kept piling up gambling debts, including $90,000 to the Colombo family loan sharks. And they couldn't find Tommy Zito. So I had to make the payments. I wasn't going to make no payments. So Arlene went to New York City police, who decided, along with the FBI, that Arlene could be instrumental in building a case against the Colombo family, including loan shark Vinnie Manzo and his boss, Anthony Scarpetti. The FBI sent Agent Oliver Halley out to Queens to meet with the mob lady. The door opened, and she said, uh, you must be Oliver. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, I hope you brought lots of money. The feds offered Arlene $500 a week to help them get the Columbos. But this would be her last gig as a mob turncoat, because this time she would have to testify in open court as a witness. Arlene took the job and began making loan shark payments in full view of FBI surveillance cameras. She was a natural. You didn't have to worry about Arlene, or you didn't have to make sure that, you, that somebody was watching every move that she made, because she could handle it. Very few women, I think, could fit that mold, that could do what she did. Arlene put together very valuable information. She got Vinnie Manzo talking about the structure of the Colombo family. Manzo told her that Carmine Persico was the head, and Scarpati, a lieutenant or capo, a golden nugget in their case against the family. Now the feds wanted direct evidence that Scarpati was collecting on the loans. So they told Arlene to insist on making payments 
to him, and not his underling, Vinnie Manzo. Manzo finally agreed and told Arlene that Scarpetti would be waiting in a candy store at this intersection in Brooklyn. But Scarpetti was not so easy to nail. Scarpetta never showed up for the payments. He had a dummy. Pretend he was him. And I said to the FBI, I says, how can we get him? In front of this Brooklyn pizza parlor, the FBI got its break when an undercover agent walked by, just as Benzo was telling his boss that Arlene was still refusing to pay anyone but him. The agent overheard something crucial. Basically, we knew we had heard Scarpetti say to Manzo, what is the f problem? She owes us the f money. And he heard this statement, basically, and, and, uh, and that statement alone tied Scarpetti in to, um, to Arlene. Arlene finally got her chance to testify against Scarpetti and others in 1986. One last chance for revenge and a lesson in the ways of American justice. It had to be impressed upon Arlene that her job as a witness was not to charm people in the way that she might on the street, uh, but to relate facts accurately uh, that corresponded back to what we already had on tape. And that was a challenge for Arlene because she had never had to do that before. When Arlene walked into the courtroom, she was scared. Facing her were 10 men, all members of the Colombo family, several whom Arlene had ratted on to the FBI. When she looked at Anthony Scarpetti, her mob lady instincts got the best of her temporarily. I said to myself, what the hell am I doing here? And I became sexually attracted all of a sudden to this man. And I became, I was saying to myself, did I do the right thing? Was this entrapment? Was this this? I mean, all of a sudden, I got a conscience with the Colombo family. But Arlene came through, beating back efforts by defense attorneys to discredit her character by pointing to her life as a mob lady. During one of the breaks uh, in the trial while she was testifying, Anthony Scott Patty's lawyer came out to me and said, you know, I've been practicing law for 40 years, and I had, I'd like to know what sewer you pulled her out of. He said, I have never met somebody like her. And I said, yeah, but she's telling the truth. And that's the important thing. Arlene testified for four days. Scarpetti was convicted of loan sharking and racketeering and got a 35-year sentence. It was Arlene's testimony that was instrumental in putting him and several other Colombo family members away. By itself, her information was of no value. But coupled with the other investigative techniques that we used in that case, it proved that she was telling the truth. After the trial, the government offered Arlene a place in the witness protection program. She turned it down, left New York, and went into seclusion. Her daughter Leslie was dying of AIDS, likely a result of her years of heroin addiction. I didn't take care of her the way I really should have. Maybe if I watched her more closely, who knows? But I can say one thing. In the last four years of Leslie's life, I was a good mother. I was, I was a damn good mother. Leslie's death left Arlene alone, alone with her memories of that mob girl, the young beauty the wise guys wanted, the smart, connected woman the government needed. Arlene only turned on the mob after she saw through its glamorous facade. Others are never attracted to the mob in the first place. One Philadelphia woman was swept off her feet, got married, and only then found out her husband was an up-and-coming wise guy. She immediately went into action to rescue herself and her family from the mafia. Unlike Virginia Hill or Arlene Weiss Brickman, some women get mixed up with the mob and then want nothing to do with it. After a brief courtship in 1964, Marianne Welch and Tommy Del Giorno got married in their hometown, Philadelphia. As far as Marianne knew, Tommy was a delivery truck driver with a steady income. I thought I was in love. Um, what does any girl know about a man, you know, if you think you're in love? Tommy did not tell Marianne that he ran a bookmaking operation connected to the Philly mob. A mob headed by the so-called docile Don, Angela Bruno. 
Bruno, in return for a piece of the action, would make sure that Tommy could always pay his bet winners, the standard mob racket. A bookmaker, if he got big enough, was going to have to seek out the mob to edge off the bets. And so Bruno would become a partner. He would be invited to be a partner. Tommy and Marianne had two sons, Tommy Jr. and Bobby. He was a good father for just as long as it suited him, where he can squeeze the time in that he wasn't, you know, busy out in the streets. Doing exactly what, Marianne was never sure. Tommy hid money in closets and left small pieces of paper around the house that Marianne figured were gambling slips. Finally, after eight years of marriage, Marianne found out the truth about her husband. Not from Tommy, but from one of his gambling friends. He said, what do you think all these meetings are every Saturday? And I had no idea. I really didn't. And then he finally told me. I just, I, I felt like I was standing outside myself looking at this person who was so dumb. How did I, how did I not know that this is what he was involved in? Marianne divorced Tommy. It was hard for her to get a waitress job and raise two young sons on her own. But in the mob, it was worse for Tommy. For a wise guy, uh, for his wife to leave him, it, it's an embarrassment. You know, what's the matter with you? You can't control your wife. The mob didn't like it either. As Marianne worked her shift one night in this South Philly crab house, a mobster named Frankie D'Alfonso came in with two bodyguards and took a table at Marianne's section. When she went to wait on him, Frankie strongly urged Marianne to leave her job. And not so much asking, it's more or less telling me that I was embarrassing Tom, that he asked me how much I needed to survive with my children, two, three, four, five hundred dollars a week. And I told him it was none of his damn business and to please get out of my life and my children's lives. I was clearing the table and he once again tried to persuade me to quit my job. And I dropped the tray and the tray, I mean, everything, all the crab shell, everything went all over him. <laughs> and he had this, like, off-white suit, and I thought, oh, I'm dead. The two guys jumped up, and I thought I was dead. I really did. I thought I was dead. And he left. Didn't say a word. After the divorce, Tommy rose through the ranks of organized crime. He opened a restaurant in South Philly called Cuz's Little Italy, just to have a place to take bets and hold meetings. Even the boss, Angelo Bruno, was a patron. The restaurant became infamous on March 21st, 1980. That night, the Godfather had his last supper there. Bruno has dinner at Cuz's. Uh, he's driven home. Uh, his car pulls up in front of his house. His driver pushes the, the, the push button and lowers the window, supposedly to let some air in, because they're in there talking and smoking. A gunman walks up with a shotgun, puts it behind Bruno's head, and pulls the trigger. And Angelo Bruno's gone. The murder of the boss set off a five-year mob killing spree. Before it ended in 1985, the bodies of 23 mobsters would litter the streets of Philadelphia. In the end, this man, Nicky Scarfo, was standing on top of the bloody heap with Tommy Del Giorno by his side. Scarfo becomes the boss, of, but Scarfo is based in Atlantic City. So Tommy Dell, Bobby's father, becomes one of the dominant gangsters in South Philadelphia. Tommy showered gifts and money on his two sons, took them to the casinos and the fights in Atlantic City. It was more than Marianne's new husband, a non-mobster named Joe Fisher, could do for the boys. This is thrown in a child's face, all this money. You know, here we were, my husband and I, their stepfather, living in a row home, just living from week to week, you know, and compared to his father's lifestyle, you know. Well, which would you choose? But during a mob retreat here in Ocean City, New Jersey in 1985, Tommy Del Giorno learned that he was in trouble with boss Nicky Scarfo. Scarfo claims that Del Giorno is he's not doing the job, he, he drinks too much, he belittles too many people. So Tommy's got this problem, you know, he's falling out of favor. New Jersey State Police had bugged the oceanfront condos of Del Giorno and other mobsters, including Scarfo, and picked up every word. The police heard Tommy identify Scarfo as the head of Philadelphia's crime family. And they heard Scarfo's associates imply that Scarfo wanted Tommy dead. New Jersey State Police Detective Ed Johnson visited Tommy's South Philly home 
to break the news. The only thing I was there to do was to uh, uh, relay a very important message, and that was that we have information that you're going to be killed and that the contract is being initiated by your boss, Nick Scarfo. Have a nice day. When the cops played the tapes for Tommy, he decided to save his own life and testify against the mob, a decision that meant he and his family had to relocate to a state police hideaway. That included Marianne's teenage boys, Tommy Jr. and Bobby. I was hysterical. I wanted to go up to his home. I wanted to kill him personally. You know, I knew someday that this was going to, something like this would happen. I knew in my heart that someday his, his evilness and his evil ways and what he was involved with was going to drag my children down. In hiding, young Bobby Del Giorno suddenly turned against his father. All his life he's grown up with his father with this macho code that you don't rat, you don't rat, you know. You got to be a stand-up guy. And here his father has become a rat. He takes off, runs back to South Philadelphia. New Jersey police tracked Bobby down and brought him to his mother. She had to convince her son to return to custody with the ex-husband she despised. I went through hell, and um, I just wanted everything to end. If I didn't have my sons, I didn't want to live. The doctors who brought Marianne back from a failed suicide attempt told her she had to live for the day her sons would return. It was all she had. American justice was meantime making the most of Tommy Del Giorno. His testimony in a dozen trials helped put away 53 members and associates of organized crime in Philadelphia, including boss Nicky Scarfo, who in April 1989 became the first mob boss in America to be convicted of first-degree murder. Tommy Del Giorno had taken part in five murders, but because he cut a deal with the government, served less than one year in prison, and went into permanent hiding. But his sons, Tommy Jr. and Bobby, wanted the crime family to get the message that they had nothing to do with their father, the rat. So during one trial in Philadelphia, Tommy Jr. testified for the defense and said his father should not be believed because the FBI had coached him. Tommy Jr. had no impact on American justice, but he did buy safe passage for himself and his brother back to Philadelphia. So oddly enough, Marianne got her wish. She got her boys back. But as long as her ex-husband is alive, Marianne knows she can't really feel safe. I think about it all the time, of him dying and this being completely over. Because, you know, in the back of your mind, you have to still say maybe it's not over. You know, you think you're safe. You think everything's done, you know. But as long as he walks this earth, it's not completely, completely over. Bobby and his brother Tommy got married and started families, both living within blocks of their mother's house in South Philadelphia. The closeness of organized crime families is legendary. But sometimes the affection can seem like a stranglehold, especially to a woman who's born into the mob, such as the eldest daughter of Chicago boss Sam Giancana. In the late 1950s, control of the Chicago outfit, which Al Capone organized, passed to this man, Sam Giancana. Like his predecessors, he had killed his way to the top. Sam Giancana was one of the most brutal persons that I ever met in my life. He was a very ruthless, a very a strong, at one time, leader of the, the underworld here in Chicago. But mob ladies have a perspective all their own, especially when their dad is the boss. He was a kind, generous human being. He uh, charitable above all things. Antoinette was Sam's first daughter. Sam treated her like a princess, and so did the entire Chicago underworld. They treated me with respect. They treated my sister with re sisters with respect. And above all, they treated my mother with respect. Respect and fear. Even among Antoinette's schoolmates, they would always whisper about her in the hallways. You know, he he hearing the little things at the locker, hey, she's so-and-so, don't touch her. Even when Antoinette married a non mobster in 1959, the underworld and the upper world paid their respects in the form of cash. Reporters got hold of the list of gift givers. In addition to organized crime figures and friends of the Giancana family, 
were the names of an alderman, the names of a member of the Cook County Board of Supervisors, and a criminal courts judge were all listed on there as contributing money. Antoinette's father had his own mob lady, the famous singer Phyllis McGuire. The FBI, knowing that mobsters often reveal secrets to their girlfriends, bugged the couple wherever they could. Sam's loyal daughter was offended. They even bugged the room she, he and Phyllis shared in, in Vegas. I mean, this is a terrible intrusion on pre people's private lives. In the 1960s, the family connections went all the way up to the White House. President John F. Kennedy and the CIA cut a deal with Sam Giancana to assassinate Cuban Premier Fidel Castro. But Antoinette says her dad was just taking the government for a ride and never intended to keep up his end of the bargain. I don't really think... My heart and soul, I don't think my father would have ever done anything to Castro, and he didn't. I mean, you know, he was playing the cat and mouse game again. Hey, we're getting money from the government, you know, let's string this, this, this thing out. But in the end, according to Antoinette, American justice did not play fair. The feds kept hounding Sam to testify about the mob. So in 1966, he fled to Mexico. But with some prodding from the U.S., the Mexicans finally kicked him out in 1974. The FBI was waiting at the border. They didn't even give him enough time to put on a pair of pants and a shirt and a pair of shoes. This is U.S. of A. This is the government. He came home like a bomb. On June 18, 1975, just days before he was due to testify before Congress about both the mob and the CIA, Sam Giancana was in his basement in suburban Chicago, cooking sausage and peppers, when he was murdered, execution style. Some said the CIA did it, fearing what Sam would reveal. But most believe the Chicago outfit killed Giancana, because he wouldn't turn over money the mob considered its own. Few people shed tears over the death of a brutal mob killer like Sam Giancana, but it's different for a woman who grew up as a mafia princess. I admire the man. I love the man. His death was a senseless death. And I hope, though, the one that has done it, whether it be the mob or the government, I just hope and pray that their lives in the end are not very comfortable. In fact, Antoinette believes her father deserves credit for the way he dispensed mafia justice. Today, there are random killings. The killings were in their organization, and it's when you did something very, very bad that there would be some reprisal. Sam and his organization, I consider angelic compared to what's going on in the world today. As a young woman, Antoinette once remarked to her infamous father that she was considering writing his biography, revealing the secrets of his life. Without skipping a beat, the Chicago boss responded, you do and I'll kill you. The truth is, Antoinette would be hard pressed to write a very informative biography of Sam Giancana. Like the wives of mobsters, daughters don't generally learn all that much about the mob. The gangsters don't want to contaminate their families with the details of their crimes. Details they could be forced to reveal to American justice. and listen to him. And then after they'd have this big fight, then they'd make love like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Siegel had made too many enemies in his violent career, and they sent a warning to Virginia, get away from Siegel. Virginia announced she was going to Paris and left Siegel on his own. On the night of June 20th, 1947, Siegel sat reading the paper on the couch in Virginia's rented house. That's where he was hit. I often wonder where she was when she first heard the news. Was she in a nightclub? Was she in her bedroom in a hotel? Or did she hear it over the radio? Or how did she hear it, you know? After the murder, Virginia attempted suicide four times with a combination of sleeping pills and booze. She kept working for the Chicago outfit, but kept a low profile. In 1950, in Sun Valley, 
Virginia pursued and married an Austrian ski instructor named Hans Hauser. But if she had dreams of finally settling down, American justice had other plans for Virginia. In 1951, Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee launched a crusade against organized crime. Virginia was a star witness. Grilled by the Kefauver Committee about her association with mobsters like Frank Costello and Meyer Lansky. Did you ever get any money from uh, Costello? No. And uh, did you ever uh, get any money from Maya Lansky? I never got money from any of those fellas. None of those none fellas. None of those fellas. None of, the, none none of these that I've been reading about or none that I knew, they never gave me anything. None of the Fichettes? No. You I don't even speak to the... I, I mean, I met that Charlie once or twice. I don't even talk to him. You don't like him? No. Virginia left the hearing convinced that she had bamboozled the senators and the committee hadn't laid a finger on her. She was wrong. American justice wanted to catch up with Virginia Hill just as it had with big mobsters like Al Capone. Through the IRS, like many organized crime figures, Hill did not report her illicit income. By this time, Hill was trying to live a quiet life in Spokane, Washington, with her husband and two-year-old son. The family was under constant FBI surveillance. Then immigration officials pressured her Austrian husband to leave the country, along with their child. And as Virginia was trying to board a plane to meet them, she was told there was a lien on her house. It would be auctioned off to pay back taxes the government said she owed, $161,000. Fearing pro They would put the money in the caskets downstairs, and she would take money out of the caskets, like a little pin money. Naturally, Grandmother Ida was a big fan of the Mafia. She loved them because they were dangerous. And not only were they dangerous, but she made a lot of money with them. So uh, she loved them even better. Arlene's father, a Rolls-Royce salesman named Irving Weiss, did favors for the mob whenever he could, and even owned a Miami Beach bar with a high-ranking member of the Italian mafia named Joe Adonis, a man renowned, among other things, for his own affair with Virginia Hill. Irving Weiss would bet on horses with his mob friends, and Wiley told his daughter, he didn't want her getting mixed up with them. He did nothing to prevent it. I always found myself at the racetrack with my father. I always found myself at the fights with my father. In other words, I was always with my father with all these different men, even though he never wanted me to be around them. But the men wanted to be around Arlene. They began giving her gifts and money in return for sexual favors. At the age of 14, she met and became involved with a soldier in New York's Bonanno crime family named Tony Mira. For Tony, I would do anything. I didn't even give a shit if I got money. I didn't get money. But over time, Arlene discovered that the New York wise guys made lousy lovers. I have been around a lot of mob guys. And they are the worst lovers in the world. They don't care if you... If they satisfy you, you have an orgasm or whatever, they're mainly concerned, let's do it, get it over with, and while you're in bed, they're telling you about, uh, let's see now, what are we going to play with the football team for Saturday or Sunday, what number am I going to play for the day, who am I going to kill, uh, how am I going to kill them? At 17, Arlene got involved with a friend of her father's, a middle-aged mobster named Nate Nelson. The mob was unhappy with Nady because he talked too much. One day in the fall of 1951, Arlene stopped by Nady's apartment to get some shopping money. When I got there, um, I saw another friend of my father's coming out of his apartment who was involved with the Italian mob, the Genovese family. And his name was Jimmy Doyle. And there he was coming out of the apartment and put his hat up to his head, carrying his coat. I'll never forget that day. And there inside, I discovered... Execution. She fled the United States and joined her family in Switzerland. The feds charged her with tax evasion and threatened to arrest her if she tried to re-enter the U.S. The Treasury Department even issued a wanted poster. Stuck in Switzerland, Hill was no longer of any use to the mob. When she turned to them for help, they ignored her, 
She began drinking heavily. Her marriage fell apart. Then, one day, she disappeared. On March 24, 1966, her body was found near a quiet brook in Austria. The coroner said it was suicide, most likely from a drug overdose. Others contend the mafia poisoned Hill, fearing she would reveal their secrets. In either case, the best-known mob lady ever died a sorry death on a deserted mountainside. Since the mob has always been run by and for men, the power of a mob lady is defined by the men around her. By that definition, Virginia Hill succeeded more than most. And yet, after the giddy, flamboyant life she led with the mob, she was abandoned, left powerless and vulnerable. But that glamorous facade can be alluring. In the 1940s, a Jewish girl on the Lower East Side of Manhattan grew up wanting nothing more than to be just like Virginia Hill. The mink coats, the casinos, the powerful men with their secret world of violence and intrigue. Arlene Weiss Brickman got her wish, but in becoming a mob lady, she lost everything. As the leading mob lady witness before the Kefauver Commission in 1951, Virginia Hill was living proof that a certain kind of woman could wield influence within the Mafia. Her performance made a powerful impression on a New York City teenager named Arlene Weiss. My role model was Virginia Hill. The first day that I ever saw Virginia Hill on television, I imagined myself to be Virginia Hill. And what I did was copy myself after her. Arlene would become a mob lady herself, and then use the power of American justice to turn against the mob. Even as a child growing up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Arlene was no stranger to the world of gangsters. Her maternal grandmother, Ida Bloom, ran a funeral parlor and was a mob lady in her own right. Her place of business was a hangout for Jewish mobsters, many of whom were establishing ties to the traditional Sicilian mafia. She had an undertaking parlor upstairs, and she had the bookmaking concession downstairs, and what they would do is pay her by the week for letting them have the business. She had all the traits of a mob lady. She was attractive, she was smart, and she knew how to keep her mouth shut. The Chicago mob soon had Virginia doing its work, carrying stolen goods, laundering money at racetracks, working for its Mexican drug racket. By the mid-1930s, the FBI had opened a file on Virginia, a suspected racketeer. She was fast becoming the most powerful woman in American organized crime. In New York City, she crossed paths with the movie star handsome and monstrously brutal Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. They called him baby blue eyes, they called him bedroom eyes. Uh, every woman that met him just went crazy about him but they were all like afraid of him. It was in Los Angeles that Bugsy and Virginia's affair became a legend. LA was a mob boomtown. The Chicago mob was closing in on the motion picture unions. New York sent Bugsy Siegel out west to tie up the gambling operations. Virginia was also in LA for the Chicago outfit, living in the Beverly Hills Hotel, or renting homes such as this. She worked the Hollywood party circuit, recruiting gamblers. It was at one of those parties that Virginia and Bugsy looked at each other and found what they wanted. Lust, I would call it. Lust and obsession, obsession with one another. Once L.A. was in his pocket, Bugsy set his sights on Las Vegas. He envisioned big-time gambling and entertainment where others saw only desert scrub. Siegel took Virginia, fellow mobster Mo Sedway, and Mo's wife, Beatrice, along for field trips. And there was only one road going out to Las Vegas, and if, with two tire tracks through the sand in the dirt, leaving L.A. And we went in, into Vegas, and I thought, gee, what do they want with a place like that? Using mob funds from New York, Siegel took charge of building a monument to greed, the Flamingo, a casino named for the beautiful long legs of Bugsy's baby, Virginia Hill. But nothing went smoothly. Construction costs doubled as Siegel was accused of skimming from the mob to pay his gambling debts. Even as the casino finally opened, his relationship with Virginia was turning more violent. With fights carried out in public, 
and settled in private. Wherever they stayed in, in, in his room, he had a, he had a suite there. Uh, everything was broken. <laughs> Lamps, ashtrays, it didn't make anything different. And the help would stand out in the corridor. Me too sometimes. 1947, three shots from a carbine rifle killed Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. The gangster who turned sleepy Las Vegas into a gambling mecca. Everyone knew the mob killed him. The same night in Las Vegas, Siegel's former partner, Mo Sedway, strode into Bugsy's casino. Moe's wife, Beatrice, stood by his side. Moe walked up to, to the microphone within five minutes after it happened and said, taking over the Flamingo, Benjamin Siegel is dead. Siegel's murder made a perverse star of the woman who was Bugsy's baby, Virginia Hill. She added a border of black lace and an air of seduction to the violent picture of organized crime. Like the men around her, she too would draw the attention of American justice. Even Congress would eventually demand to know where she got her power and her money. Like a lot of girls, that they've uh, given me things and brought me everything I want. Then when I was with Ben, he paid for everything. By Ben, you mean Ben Siegel? Yes. And... Uh, he gave me some money, too, and bought me a house in Florida. Virginia's rise was typical of women who get involved with the mob. A small-town tramp from Georgia, she fled to the bright lights of Chicago's 1933 World's Fair. Working sometimes as a dancer, sometimes as a hooker, the voluptuous teenager soon fell in with the mafia. Then Virginia met an accountant for crime boss Al Capone named Joe Epstein. He taught her manners and style. She took Joe's advice, but she did not respond to his advances. I know that Joe Epstein loved Virginia Hill. He told me that, that he loved Virginia Hill. And he had a very, very uh, obsession with Virginia Hill as her mentor. Uh, and, and he felt that if it wasn't for him, uh, Virginia Hill that would be, never have been amounted to anything. She would have been a, a, a lowly prostitute from the South. The gangster's lavish lifestyle and brutal power seemed glamorous to a poor Southern girl. Like Virginia, young Beatrice Sedway also left a small town to become a nightclub dancer and a mob lady. Whoever was a sweetheart or a mistress or anything was just kept in the best ways. They had everything they wanted. If they'd have been millionaires, they couldn't have been better treated. Being kept wasn't enough for Virginia Hill. She wanted some of the power from the men who ran the mob, 